Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 72, 10 for 50. 10 games for under $50. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, today we've got some game suggestions for Charles, who's looking to spend 50 bucks on new games. I've later got a review of Tower of Madness from Smirk and Dagger Games. That's the Cthulhu Kerplunk, really impressive looking game. Then in our week of review, I've got a bunch of stuff. I've got some Rhino Hero, some more Carpe Diem, and a not so great experience with Horrified. Then, if we've got time, I want to talk a bit about the new Paranoia Happiness is Mandatory PC game that I got to check out on Sunday. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of in the week previous. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found pretty much everywhere as Dark Elf LX. All right, to start off today, I do have to apologize to a bunch of you. Uh, Rujo Utila was the one who pointed out that I was missing some comments. I apologize to all of you who commented on the Tabletop Bellhop website and never saw your comments go live and never got any replies. I wasn't trying to ignore you. Uh, that was totally my fault. I thought WordPress sent me notifications when it flags stuff as spam. Like I get a notification every time there's a comment, but it doesn't notify me anytime there's a comment into terms is spam. I had stuff in there going back to August. Well, I'm sure we could go on for days about some of the good, bad, or various website systems, but needless to say, we do value your comments. Yeah. And even if WordPress might, we don't consider them spam. <laughs> no, not at all. So now I've gone through most of them and approved the actual comments and replied to almost all of these. So this is the reason we've got some comments on older content to talk about today. And there's so much of it because we do have a bit of backlog. We're probably going to spread out some of it over a couple of weeks so I can kind of group similar comments together. Now, up first, this one isn't based on the website. Prospero Hall, the design company behind Jaws, Disney Villainous, and Horrified from Ravensburger, actually took the time to comment on the review and unboxing we posted of Horrified. For the unboxing, they wrote, thank you for unboxing our game. We hope you continue to enjoy it. We warned you. Uh, that's an allusion to the, the box, what's on the back of the board when you open the box. It notes that on there. And then on the review, they commented, thank you for checking out our game. We're thrilled that you liked it and hope you continue to enjoy it. Regarding your question about art, we hired Phantom City Creative for the game illustration. And in our house designer, our in-house designers finalized everything with graphic design to ensure maximum spooks. And I posted the link for that in the chat. And we'll post that in our show notes as well, phantomcitycreative.com. Thanks to the group at Prospero uh, Hall for giving us those updates and uh, paying attention to the content. Now, Christoph Vesna had a comment about last week's topic, where S. Darkwell was having trouble maintaining focus when teaching games. They wrote, usually when I get nervous teaching a new player, I have a shot of vodka before and it negates the awkwardness. Nothing to excess, of course, but just enough to take the edge off. Ah, thanks, Christoph. Hey, whatever works for you, just make sure you... Uh... Do it in moderation. Don't overdo it. You don't want to be teaching games with well inebriated. And I'm pretty sure we have a whole show topic about playing games in public spaces like bars. Up next, I do have a comment from Yuho Rutilla, a patron of the show, who commented on our best two-player cooperative games from an article two weeks back. They write, my recommendation is Dawn of Peace Markers. Makers, sorry, Markers, wow. My recommendation is Dawn of Peacemakers. It's a cooperative game for two to four players, but works very well with just two. It has 12, it's a, wow, I can't talk today. It has the 12 scenario campaign that keeps you hooked just enough. 
And if you want to reduce alpha gamerism, each player can have their own personal goals per scenario. I played this with my children, 11 and 8, using co-op goals. Now, personally, I have never heard of Dawn of Peace Markers. It looks like it might have been a Kickstarter based on all the minis and the box style. Well, thanks, Yuho. Uh, some of the pieces in that look gorgeous. Uh, I took a look into it earlier today, and it was, in fact, a Kickstarter. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like they might only do small print runs because it seems to be hard to get a hold of, even from their own website. But it is definitely something to look at uh, and with some gorgeous uh, fantasy-style uh, minis involved in it. Now, next, we've got a comment from Ron Bala referencing our two-player board games for a date night article. Ron writes, really nice article, Mo. I'd second Lost Cities and maybe add Battle Line by GMT. Your mentions of other heavier games, Twilight Struggle, Hammer of the Scots, are two of my favorites, though take longer and are more intensive games. Well, thanks, Ron. Um, I'm sad to say Battle Line or Shot and Totten, as I think the most recent version is called, though they might have then gone back to Battle Line. I don't know. It's known under both names, Shot and Totten and Battle Line. Just didn't go over that well. Deanna and I tried it. Uh, we tried a couple times because this game is really high regarded, really high ratings on Board Game Geek. A lot of people say it's some of the best two player games out there, but I don't know. It just didn't click with us. It does have a lot of fans out there, so I'm sure it's a solid recommendation, and we'll be sure to toss it in the show notes. Now, here's another comment on the same two-player game article. Matt writes, I love Flux. It's easy to learn and can be both quick to play or slow and challenging. And I love the rules are always changing. It has a small footprint, too. Also picked up The Mind as per your recommendation. Thank you. Me and the wife loved it. It's so easy to learn and a pain in the butt at levels 10 plus. Laugh out loud. So thanks. Well, thanks, Matt. So glad to hear you're enjoying The Mind. Those who love it seems to always really love it. Now, Aaron, just Aaron, commented on our 25 of the best games for when you have exactly five players articles to say Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth is a great new five player from the creators of Mansions of Madness that my group has been playing a lot. Well, thanks, Aaron. I've got a copy of Journeys in Middle-Earth so sitting downstairs. I gotta say it looks fantastic. I've been hearing really good things about it. I know Tori and Kat, who we play Gloomhaven with, are just, excuse me, just diving into that right now. Personally, though, I don't know when I am going to get to that. Trying to fit in another campaign-based game in my current gaming schedule is going to be rough, especially because I've, I've learned since that you do need the same players every week to play that one to fully enjoy the campaign, and that one's a rough one for my group. It does look great, and I'm sure it's a solid recommendation. Again, we'll toss it in the show notes this week. Now, at this point, I think we'll stop for the comments for this week, uh, save some for next week. Now that I know where to look for that spam folder, we shouldn't end up with this kind of backlog again, and we should be right on things. Well, that's it for, the, that's it for this week's comments. Thanks to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell, for the after show uh, tonight, we uh, we're having a little bit of uh, discussion about uh, the horrors of working in retail at this time of year, and our hearts going out to those of you yes. out in the community who do have to uh, put up with, uh, you know, the jerks and the, and the the horrors of people with no sense of decency out shopping. <laughs> yeah, even 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 more so for those of you out shopping, please be kind to your retailers. Realize Absolutely. that they're under stress. They're dealing with a lot of people at this time. And the person you're talking to is probably not responsible and has nothing to do with the thing you're pissed off about. And has probably worked <sighs> far more hours than they normally would have because yes. it's holiday and they're trying to be open for you. Uh, Personally, I'm, so I am really frustrated with the holiday drivers in Windsor lately. Wow. Everyone is in a hurry to get everywhere and Unfortunately, our local scout troop decided to take the girls out to the movies, which was pretty cool. Unfortunately, the movie theater is at the mall. And I don't know. I know in the States, people keep talking about how mall culture is basically dead, right? And like the latest season of Stranger Things, all but oh, my God, mall culture. I'm like, it never stopped in Windsor. Devonshire Mall is still the place to go and the place to hang out, at least for teenagers and that. Like, I, I don't know. Windsor just never got hip enough for whatever the next big thing was supposed to be. We're still stuck in the mall culture days. And oh, my God. It took me 50 minutes to drive down Howard just to get to the mall. And, like, I took Vimy to get there. Like, I didn't just take Howard. I tried to get as far up Howard as I could before getting on it. And, yep. like, 45 minutes just to get to the mall. Parking, I think we were a five-minute walk away from the theater. Like, mm -hmm. it was terrible. Yeah, no. And we didn't even go in the mall. Like, I just 
hit the movie theater, yeah. drop the kids off, and then took off. I suspect some of it in Windsor has to do with people avoiding downtown for the casino and the American well, drinkers. Yeah, our, <laughs> down, our downtown is not kid yeah. friendly. That, though, though we we spent a lot of time. Well, there. we did, but the, then the casino happened. The casino, a lot of the casino stuff happened post, uh, yeah. our, you know, our downtown time. That's true. That's true. Um, and then uh, we had a little bit of chat about too. We had our some questions about the coffee maker you guys are using, which is the Keurig yeah, two hundred. The, the Keurig two hundred, which I had no idea. And so Ryan asked this question that it brews pots of coffee. Yeah. Like I, I had no clue. And you can get K-cups to make pots. Well, at least you used to when this came out. Right. No one sells them anymore. Well, I think I it's think because you can't get enough coffee into what do a pod to make a real Well, no, pot it's a coffee. bigger pod. It's oh. a bigger pod. Oh, and okay. my machine fits bigger pods. Oh, interesting. Now, the thing is, we're, we looked at it and I'm like, well, who would want to, right? Like people buy a Keurig for single cup coffee. If you want a coffee like a pot you buy a coffee maker Usually, yeah. and you you put your own grinds you don't <laughs> buy k-cups right yeah. and i think it failed terribly so right and we, I, we looked into it and there's like this uh, the special pot you have to buy and it slots into the front a certain way and then there's a thing you have to do with the inside to fit the bigger pods and i'm like i'll try it no i can't find a like you can find pods for like 70 bucks each because i guess right. they're collectible i don't know or <laughs> I'm guessing that's just the Amazon algorithms that no one else has them. So we'll put the price up. I have no idea. Yeah. Interesting. I was not aware that was a thing. I have yeah. a really, I have a decent coffee maker when I need to make a pot of coffee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have one too. We have, we have a nice one where you put beans in the top and coffee comes out the oh, bottom because it go. grinds it before you make it. It's a really good high end coffee maker that I bought years ago. Cause I used to drink a lot of coffee even then. Yeah. But yeah, was... Keurig, Keurig has single, I forget what they're, they're called K carafes instead of oh, K cups. Okay carafes and like i said you can look it up but you can't actually find them anywhere you can get the pots but there's no point in buying the pot yeah no obviously all right uh all right uh back on topic somewhat we're talking an awful lot about coffee for a board game podcast uh today we're talking about game shopping so you got 50 bucks burning a hole in your pocket just what do you buy uh what i'd love to see from the lobby is what they would buy if they had 50 bucks to spend on games right now today you're going shopping what are you picking up we'll be back checking with the lobby again during the show we're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions you can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletop tabletopbellhop.com and click on ask the bellhop as uh, social media works too we're everywhere as tabletop bellhop one word Best ways for questions come through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we've got a question from Charles Baruch, who writes, Let's say I had a $50 check, and the stipulation is I use it for fun. What are the 10 games I should consider? All right, great question, Charles. I dig this one. I don't know. I, I, I just like the vibe of this one. So first off, I'm going to gonna kind of classify things. I'm going to take this to mean... For whatever reason, Charles can buy one game. So he's got 50 bucks and he can only buy one game. So I'm going to be looking at this as the best games you can get that cost under 50 bucks. And not how many he can get for 50 bucks. Because that would be a totally different way to look at it, right? Like for 50 bucks, how many great games can I? I can get the mind and I can get all these little pocket games. I don't know. No, I'm looking at you're buying one game for 50 bucks. Here's a selection of 10 of the best. Uh, well, I'm using Amazon.ca. Uh, for mine, and I'm ignoring sale pricing, so my games are going to be a little different than uh, what you're going off of. Yeah, because I'm going to use Amazon.com, and I'm going by the prices I, right now. Right now, being earlier today when I when I wrote up the show notes for this. Now I am going to be using the current sale prices. If I was going to use MSRP, this would probably be a very different list. I'm also not going to account for taxes are shipping at this point because amazon you're only taxed if you're in a certain state and while well, shipping is usually free at amazon i'm not going to count for shipping to canada yeah uh now, now, i noticed i noticed in the com in the comments ryan's already brought up board game bliss uh, i actually considered using board game bliss for mine the problem is they don't stock anything so the whole concept oh. was you could go out right now and buy something for 50 bucks but any of the games i would have wanted that were under 50 bucks on board game bliss weren't available so yeah. I, I really do like the prices of Board Game Bliss, but they have got a real stock problem that uh, I'm not sure how to address. So, 
Yeah, they, they don't want to take the chance of keeping stuff in stock. I don't know. I'd like yeah. they're almost better to list a two out, two week shipping time so they can get it in from their their supplier. Yeah, you know. But yeah, Sean and I were discussing it, and I like I've seen Sean's list. He's seen my list. We actually did our own list this time, so that's something different for the show this week. And I saw his list. And I'm like, oh, there's no way you can get this for under fifty bucks. He's like, nope. And I'm like, look, it's on Board Game List. Like, look, sold out. Yeah. I'm like, Jesus, how about this? No, <laughs> sold out. Oh, how about that? No, sold out. Yeah. Like if they, if it's sold out, don't list it or something. I don't know. Well, Just, you can sort annoyed. by what's in stock at least. Yeah. And that was then that was what happened when I went to Board Game Bliss. The first thing I did is said sort by price in stock only, and I went down the list going, I don't want any of this crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. All right. The other thing with this list is I don't know exactly what Charles' taste in games is, so. I'm going to be looking for some of the best games I've played at this press point. Games I think are going to appeal to most gamers. And I also tried to make sure to get a variety of types of games. Like, honestly, if I was shopping for myself, I, there's a couple games on here I probably wouldn't have listed, but I wanted to make sure I kind of touched all the bases because I wanted to make sure I could touch pretty much anything Charles might be into. Now, this is my list. So if Charles is all about party games, I, he's probably going to strike out on this list. Uh, now, for my list, I, I tend to be more of a family gamer. So I you know, tend to avoid more of the heavy Euros and go for something that I'm going to be able to play with my kids or, or adults. But, mm -hmm. you know, a lot, uh, a lot more of uh, the lighter weight, I guess, yes. is, than, uh, than oh, yours. Family weight games, lighter weight games. Yep. Fair enough. All right, so my first recommendation is completely cheating, and it's only valid for those of you right now, is if you go to Amazon, they dropped a huge Star Wars sale today. They have up to 70% off on various games, and they have Star Wars Imperial Assault for 60% off. Like that, that you, like there's your buy. Go buy it right now. Uh, now, I got to admit, probably won't stay in tomorrow. I haven't checked, but I bet you it's probably sold out now, to be honest. I haven't looked in about four hours. Um... I'm sure when I do this up as a blog toast, I won't be able to use Imperial Assault. Uh, <laughs> there's no way it's going to be at that price. If you can get Imperial Assault for under 50 bucks, there you go. Done deal. Just buy that. We've talked about Imperial Assault many times. Great value, even at full price. Like, I actually strongly recommend this game at full price. Not only do you get a great competitive or cooperative campaign game, you get a great two-player miniature skirmish game as well. Yeah. Now, in my list, I mostly stayed away from the licensed games because of the very reason that they generally raise the price. Uh, generally, aside from sales like this, you're best to stay away from licensed games uh, that are on the lower end of the scale that would fit into your budget because yeah. those lower ones are kind of the iffy licensed games. You're you generally the, the more pricey ones are going to be the more solid licensed products. Just ignore anything by Riverhouse. They, they, you can get them for under 50 now, but they're $60 games and they're not worth the price you can get them at now. Right. All right. Second recommendation comes from the same sale. Uh, again, I'm cheating here. Star Wars Armada. It's only 4402 right now, like 55% off. It's ridiculous. This is a miniature battle game that operates at a fleet scale for Star Wars. So you're talking capital ships and big movements and little fighters. Uh, very different from X Wing. And uh, that's for. Uh... 98% of our fans who aren't here live. Oh, and we're being told it's sold out already. So, oh, there you go. Even though so the fans are this this live. This morning, yeah, <laughs> when I made this list. All right. So, we're not even going to count those, right? I, we said we we're going to give 10 games. I'm not even going to count those two. I was hoping to give our chat room a heads up on some amazing deals there before they sold out. But yeah, I, I didn't expect that one to last, but there was always a chance. But you never know with Amazon, these two games could stay under 50 bucks tomorrow or in two weeks from now. Um, the only thing I can say is follow at tabletop underscore deals on Twitter. And I'll let you know if I see him drop that low again. There we go. All right. So here are 10 games. Well, 10 games for me uh, that you should be able to get from under 50 on Amazon right now. None of these should be sold, sold out. Uh, Deanna will probably verify it with us in the chat. These ones weren't lightning deals. These weren't deal of the day. They should still be good. So I'm going to start off with Shogun. Uh, when I checked the price this morning, it was $47.99. Uh, everyone who listens to this should know how much I love Shogun. Uh, you may recognize it as the name Wallenstein. I actually prefer Shogun. It's uh, like the feudal Japan theme. This is a mix of a Euro-style area majority scoring mixed with cube-pushing folk on a map area control battling. Uh, toss in the very cool mechanic of the cube tower for battles, and you have one of my favorite games of all time. It, it might be my number one. Like, I... Every time I play this game, I love it. Every time I talk about this game, it makes me want to play it again. 
I have loved this game for years. Every year on my birthday, I used to force people to play. And, well, for, you know what? Force them to play because everyone's scared of it. It's an intimidating-looking game. So, And it's so much better than Immortals. But yes. sadly, you're not going to find that under 50 bucks in Canada. Uh, you might be able to find Immortals. You are. And, the, <laughs> and to be honest, uh, Brian's asking in the chat room if you can find the big box for a good price. You don't want to. The, the expansions you add with the big box, I don't think actually improve the game. I think they muddy the game up. They give you options you don't need. I am actually not a fan of that. And they're just three small expansions that are tossed in. That was one of those, I know, to me, queen marketing things that they even made a big box for that. It, it's almost like queenie level of little additional stuff. Just stick to the base game. All right. And that was Shogun. All right. Another big box queen game. Uh, same size box, similar mechanic. And that's Amerigo. When I looked earlier this morning, it was forty-five twenty-three on Amazon. This is another game that uses a cube tower, but in a very different way. Uh, in this Steffenfeld point salad, the cubes that come out of the tower determine which actions you can take. And then the number of cubes tell you how powerful they are. And then there's a bias on every round that a certain color is going to come out, but it's not necessarily true because of the way the tower works. Uh, this is one of my favorite all-time felds. It's an exploration game. You're building islands, you're building buildings. I actually want to, I got to play this one again soon. It's been a while since I broke this out. It's a bigger, heavier game, but one of my favorite felds of all time. And remember, it's a point salad. The cubes are not edible. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> and that not. is Amerigo. Anything's edible if you try hard enough. <laughs> all right, up next, uh, away from the felds, away from the big box games to something a little smaller, at least in profile. Uh, that is Orleone. You can get this for $45.98. Uh, in my opinion, this is one of the best modern board games out there. This is one of the best games to come out in the last four years. Uh, it's a Euro bag builder, truly fantastic. By far my favorite game that Tasty Minstrel Games has put out. It's hit the table multiple times, and I've never gotten sick of it. I've actually got some expansions for it, and I want to play them, but like I enjoy the base game so much that I tend to sit down and like, oh, let's just play the base game, because let's get going. We don't have to learn something new. Huge fan of Orléans. This uh, this one's even affordable in Canada. Oh, interesting. That's good to know. I, seriously, like this, if you were into a, a step above Terraforming Mars for weight or a step above Race for the Galaxy, just that little bit heavier, you're going to love this game. Up next, Roll for the Galaxy. This was currently 4084. Now, I will admit, I generally prefer Race for the Galaxy. But if you're going to spend the money, why not get the more deluxe, thicker components, lots of dice, dice cups, cooler looking roll for the galaxy. Plus, I know that most people out there, most people I talk to, most podcasts I listen to actually prefer it to race for the galaxy. This is their preferred for the galaxy game. So I'm going to put that on the list. Despite the fact I do prefer race, I do really like roll for the galaxy and it's a solid game. Now, I've always got a game going of this on Board Game Arena. I just can't disagree. It's a solid game. All right. Just mentioned it. We'll bring it up again. Terraforming Mars. You knew this had to be on the list, but this one has to be on sale to get at this point. Uh, it's had to be here. If I, if you can get it for under 50, just buy it. It, it. It's it's normally a little bit more than that. It's been this price. It's been 45 bucks on Amazon, 35% off for like two months now. So I don't know what's going on with that, why it's still on sale or when that's going to end. But uh, this is probably the one that's going to have the most universal appeal that like every game, almost every green group's going to like this. I, I've met very few people who don't like Terraforming Mars. Now, if you're totally into your party games or dexterity games, OK, maybe not. But if you're into Euros at all, uh, this is almost a bust buy for everyone. Yeah, no, a great classic that us Canadians pay through the nose for. <laughs> yep, unfortunately. All right, uh, next is a $40 game, $39.99. That is Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game, I think is the full title of this one. Uh, this is my most iffy recommendation, but I wanted to make sure I had at least one cooperative game on the list. Like I said, I don't know what Charles is looking for. So I wanted to make sure I had at least one co-op on there. And for a co-op for 50 bucks, this is the game I personally would pick. Now, I personally love the Legendary Encounter system. I like that way better than the base Legendary games. You're probably not even going to get me to sit down at a table to play Legendary Marvel, but I love Legendary Encounters. Uh, the Alien one so far is the best of the bunch. Does a great job of catching the, catching the tension of the Alien movies with the hidden movement and everything going on and having to work it together. Fantastic game. 
Yeah, and this game is quite expandable as well. So if you grow out of it or just love it that much, there's uh, a bunch more you can get into. Yeah, if you pick up the Predator version, I guess you can actually do an Aliens versus Predator, right. which just sounded makes sense. Really cool. All right, another heavier Euro Viticulture. Uh, the most current printing would be the Essentials Edition from Stonemaier Games, which you can pick up for forty five eighteen. Uh, this wine-based worker placement game completely blew me away when it came out. Uh, it still stands the test of time. Even having now played Vinhos, which is a very similar themed game, to me, they're both very different games, very different mechanics, and both scratch different itches and are both fantastic. There are so many mechanics to love here. I love the way the wine ages and you want to kind of wait to use it, but sometimes you need it. How you improve your vineyard with little meeples to represent all the improvements you've made. And the way that you play through different seasons and use your workers in different seasons and visitors coming in. Uh, this is still one of my favorite Stonemaier games. Really dig Viticulture Essential Edition. And that Essential Edition removes the old requirement that I used to say, if you have Viticulture, you have to buy Tuscany. You get the best of Tuscany in the Essentials Edition. And much like fine wine, not all the best ones cost the most. Yeah, very true. <laughs> I've had some very good, very cheap wine. All right, next is Agricola for $47.99. Now, generally, everyone always compares Agricola and Caverna. It's hard not to. Same designer, one released after the other, the other being a follow-up. Uh, I personally am always going to pick Caverna, but you're never going to find that for under 50 bucks. Or if you do, good job, grab it. Uh, for right now, there's no way you're going to find Caverna at that price. Agricola is still a very solid game. I'm never going to turn down a chance to play. If someone asks me to play, I'm not going to say no. I'm going to be like, oh, no, bring out Caverna. No, if they ask me to play Agricola, I'll play it, or Agricola. But yes, personally, I'd rather play the other. Yes, it can be tight. Yes, it can be punishing. There's a reason people call it Misery Farm, but I personally think that's a feature, not a flaw. I like how tight this game is. I like how you never have enough resources and how you're always stressing out about trying to feed your family. Yeah, it's still over a decade old and still in the top 30 games of all times. I didn't realize it's a decade old. It doesn't feel that old. Yeah, it was 2007. It's over a decade old. Wow. All right, it's another Feld. You can tell I'm a Feld fan, and Felds <laughs> tend to be at this right price point, right? I happen to check this. Just, just barely scratches under at $49.99. You can get the brand new printing of Castle Burgundy just released this month. Uh, this looks significantly better than the original is probably the most polite thing I can say. Uh, there are a huge number of complaints about the original Castles of Burgundy and its draw, drab, blah, colors all look the same. So they put out an updated deluxe version and it's slightly brighter browns and grays and dark greens. I, got, I, I don't get it. I was really hoping this new release would pop a bit more, but I gotta say, you know what? It looks boring. Don't let the, the dry paste on theme fool you. This is a fantastic dice-driven, tile-drafting, heavy Euro game from Steffenfeld. Yeah, it's a Euro. It doesn't have to look pretty to make you think. Up next, for 45 bucks, you can pick up Clank. This is my 10th recommendation. It's my last one. Uh, Clank refreshes the mechanic of deck building by adding the push your luck dungeon act crawl aspect of the game. How deep do you dive? Do you risk trying to get through artifacts or do you just jump in and out quickly and hope the dragon catches the other players? A very solid deck builder on its own as well. Now, a lot of people seem to prefer Clank in space. Personally, I find it adds a little too much length to the game and it's a little too fiddly. I like the, the dash and go you can have in the original game. Yeah, sadly, I wanted this on my list, but you're not going to get it under 50 bucks in Canada without some effort. So uh, That's hard to say. All right, I went into this with the assumption that Charles was looking for board games. But you know what? He might be more interested in RPGs. Just in case, uh, I'm not going to do 10, because that's... We're going to be here all night if we keep just doing 10 on every possible variation on this. Here are five RPG recommendations that you can currently get for under 50 bucks. Uh, number one is going to be the Star Trek Adventures Core Rulebook 
for the newest game from Modifius Entertainment. This is the latest Star Trek game to come out, the current license for Star Trek. Uh, you can get the core rulebook for $37.90. I love playing Star Trek. One of the best RPG experiences I've ever had was running Star Trek. It happened to be the fastest system, but I don't think that mattered because everyone knows Trek. They know the tropes. They know the techno babble. They know the world. It's just so easy to role play Trek and everyone just gets it. And this is the latest game and the reviews are extremely positive. Yeah. The, the last time we played, I actually spent the entire drive down from Toronto at the time to Windsor listening to how to speak Scottish because yeah. I was playing an engineer. So yeah, we, we weren't stereotyping much in that. No, game, no, no. And yes, the the actual box set can be had for even less. But I figured if you were going to go out 50 bucks, you may as well go with the full core rule book and dive right in. Uh, Ryan's asking if you could get get the the intro box set. You can. All right. Up next, I got to recommend Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I'm not saying it because it's huge right now, like possibly bigger than it's ever been. I've played every edition of D&D that's been out. Well, actually not true. Since second edition, I did play a couple games of AD&D, and technically I played one game of OD&D that made me hate the system for many years. But I played many of the editions, and I got to say the new fifth edition is really good. It is the most fun I have had playing D&D since second edition. Now, you know, for 50 bucks, you can get a player's handbook. That's the MSRP. They're $49.99. Uh, you can obviously find that cheaper. Uh, you can also get the D&D starter set for, it's been as low as 12 bucks, which is crazy. It's not that low right now. Or the new D&D Essentials Kit, which was a Target exclusive, but is now available everywhere. Now, I wasn't sure where to start if I was going to dive into running 5th at D&D, because I have not actually run it. I played it a few times. And it seems like still the best place to start is the starter set. The um, Minds of Fandelver adventure that is in that is supposedly fantastic. One of the best D&D adventures ever published. And what I learned the other day is you actually make characters. It's not a here's your pre-gen and go. So I think that's going to get you more immersed into D&D than any of the other things. Now, for a while, you could actually get the core rulebook gift set that had all three books and a DM screen for 50 bucks. But it seems like at this point that ship has passed. When I went to write this list, I was hoping to be able to find that. But it seems like it's gone. Now, if I had 50 bucks and I had to buy an RPG, I would be grabbing the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition starter set. I have been a fan of Wolfrup Warhammer since the game came out in 1986. I think I picked it up that year at up in Toronto at the Silver Snail and have been a, in love with that setting. Uh, you can see a pile of Warhammer Games Workshop stuff behind me. Uh, this has been my go-to world to run games in for years. I have played this one. I have played every edition released, but I haven't had the time or the money or the group to check out fourth edition uh, Warhammer. So if I had 50 bucks, I'd be like, I'm buying it. I'm going to buy the new starter set. I did get to see it at Origins, and man, it is a beautiful box set. That's cool. All right, if Cyberpunk is your thing... Our Telsorian has dropped the new edition, Cyber, Cyberpunk Red. Uh, they have a jumpstart kit. It's under 50 bucks. From what I understand, Cyberpunk's back to its 2020-2013 um, roots, D10-based system. Uh, they basically decided to completely ignore version 3.0, which was much maligned by the, the fan base. I've heard nothing, about good, nothing but good things about this new edition of the classic game from Mike Pondsmith, released from Our Telsorian Games. Gotta love uh, Cyberpunk 2020. And actually came up last night on uh, Misdirected. They were doing their discussion on life paths. And uh, mm -hmm. Traveler and uh, Traveler and Cyberpunk were uh, much discussed. There you go. So the original, I don't, the original didn't have a life path. Did it? Did it? Cybergen had one. No, no. 20, 2020 had a cyber, uh, it was a mild, it was more of a background path. Than, okay, uh, I, did, I was going to say, because we used to use the one from Mechton. Because you you could but you could roll things like you know hot dates and fast cars and, and it didn't yeah, do yeah. anything but it okay. was yeah it was because I know other Artosaurian systems had actually had a really yeah. solid life path yeah the Mechton the Mechton one was yeah that was one we used to steal and we'd yeah, use yeah. that one all right now if you like your whole cyberpunk thing but like elves and magic mixed in there you can get the new six world source book for Shadowrun for under fifty bucks that's the core rulebook not just an intro box set. 
Now, Shadowrun's never been my thing. Uh, system has a ton of fans over the years. It's still around. And for those of you complaining, the system's too fiddly and uses too many D6s, this new 6th Age edition is supposed to streamline all of that. Now, at Origins, I did pick up the new starter set because I keep saying I'm going to finally give Shadowrun a try. I, mean, I, I avoided it for years. I, I feel like I'm missing some geek cred by not playing it, but I still haven't had a chance to dive into that. Yeah, no, my uh, my Cyberpunk doesn't have pointy ears in it. So. That, that's why I put <laughs> both on the list. Just say if you like Cyberpunk with or without pointy ears. Yep. Now, for those of you outside of Canada, you might not be aware of the kinds of pricing that we tend to get here. Very few of those games, mochos, are available to us here under 50 bucks without dealing with a massive sale, uh, with some soaring up to easily double or more of the prices that he's mentioned. Now, for my take, I went something more for us Canadians, but also more family-oriented, because those are the games that get to the table for me. Uh, and to start off, I went with Scrabble or Upwards. For 39 bucks, uh, you, there are various different versions and costs, but, you know, for for under 50 bucks, no home should be without a copy of Scrabble or Upwards. Yeah, just don't come to Windsor and play with Deanna. She'll win. Like, I've given up. We don't need Scrabble on our host or Upwards or Boggle or any other vocabulary-based game. It's it's just not fun playing that anymore and just losing repetitively. Well, you married a librarian, so, yes. you know. <laughs> uh, next up, Azul. For $48, I think we've made our case for this sufficiently over the episodes. Yeah, it's a totally solid recommendation. Like, I actually considered putting it on my list, but it's just, it was a little too short in U.S. for that $50 target. You get you can almost get two copies of Azul for the same price. Yep. Uh, next up, King Domino. Uh, on the lower end, $26, but it's such a great game, and it leaves you with some extra money. You can buy something else along with it. There you go. Yeah, solid recommendation. I'm a, I'm a fan of this one. Light and quick, but solid game. Yeah. Uh, Hogwarts Battle. Okay, so my one licensed game, uh, I get the deck builders aren't for everyone, but for under 50 bucks, Hogwarts Battle is a solid deck builder, and it's great for both kids and adults. Yeah, no complaints here. I enjoyed the few times I played it. That's not, I got to break that out with Big G again. I, I like the fact it was one of those variable market deck builders, and oh, come on, Harry Potter, right? Almost everyone loves Harry Potter. Exactly. Uh, next up, Sagrada for 45 bucks, a great game, and Canadian as well. Yeah, you can actually meet the designer at BreakoCon in March. Uh, great recommendation, great game. Absolutely, great guy. I was uh, at a couple of his panels last year. Uh, next up, for $34, Patchwork. A great, quick, thinky filler. Yeah, that one's cheaper than I thought. I, I swear I paid more than that for Patchwork. That's good. Uh, what's weird about that, I never hear anyone talk about this game anymore. It's like, it's like the, the hype has died off on that, and it's a shame, because it's really solid. Deanna and I continue to enjoy it. Uh, next up, the one that uh, sort of caught my eye was the Quest for El Dorado. For $36, you get card drafting, deck building, family fun. Yeah, I've heard good things about this one. I haven't played it myself, but it's been around for a while. It's on a lot of top lists. It seems really popular. Yep. Uh, and then we have uh, Splendor. $39. It's a classic for a reason, even if some people have moved on. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, I don't play it much. <laughs> but my kids are playing my copy now, so it's getting plenty of use. Yep. Uh, and now I couldn't do this on Amazon. I had to go elsewhere, but <laughs> if you hunt around in Canada, go cuckoo for 25 bucks. You'll just buy it. You'll thank us. Yeah, that, that's, I, that's a good price for that. Cause the one thing with go cuckoo is like, you got a metal tin and you got all those sticks, you got a wooden meeple. I don't know the plastic or whatever the eggs are made out of. It is not a cheap game, especially for something marketed at little kids. But you know what? I like for the amount I played that game. If you do that whole math, where you're like, oh, the amount I spent divided by the number of times I played, like I'm probably at pennies a play at this point. Yep. Uh, and uh, finally, for $16, Hanabi. I've been playing it on BGA a ton. It's just a fun game worthy of having in your collection. Uh, if you go on Board Game Bliss, you can find the deluxe for under 50 bucks, but of course it's out of stock. What? Stuff out of stock on Board Game Bliss? Say it ain't so. All right. So we did, Sean and I sat down earlier today and went through this and we did our own research. We did our own thing. We kind of compared lists. And I realized earlier, like later in the day, before the show went live, that every game I mentioned here, I own I, I, all 10 of them, which makes sense, right? Like that's why I recommend them. These are all great games I own, right? And I was, I brought up my pile of games, right? The pile that's behind me here for our backdrop. And I'm like, hey, I own all these. So what would I say 
if I had 10 bucks or 50 bucks and I had to go buy eight games, right? So this is what I figured I would go buy. Now I got to say, first thing it is, I build up my, my Amazon wish list and I saw 59, 58, 56, 55, 51, 99. I'm like, yeah, I, I guess I need a $60 budget for most of the games at the very top of my wish list. But I did manage to find 10 games I want pretty badly for under 50 bucks. Uh, it's gonna, I'm going to go through these a lot quicker than earlier. I'm not going to describe the games in full detail, but up first is going to be Merlin, a uh, Rondell-based Steppenfeld game. Got to try this at Origins. Three Rondells, great Arthurian theme, really cool game. Merlin's number one. Men at Work is a dexterity game from Pretzel Games. The people that bring you junk art and flick them up. This one's all about like stacking your workers and stuff. Looks fantastic. Uh, Clans of Caldonia. Now, I am told that if you dig Terra Mystica and or Gaia Project, that this is the next step. This is even better. And I love both those games. So this looks sweet to me. Uh, Renegade Games, Architects of the West Kingdom. Uh, this is another one I've heard really good things about. I probably should be more excited about the Paladins one. But you know what? I kind of want to play the games in the order they were released. Just because I loved Raiders of the North Sea so much. I don't feel like skipping ahead in this series. I want to discover them all. And people are saying Architects is better than Raiders, and I love Raiders. Uh, Starship Samurai. This one no one knows about. Plaid Hat Games put out a Gundam game where you have giant mecha and you have the space battles and the space fleets, and it just looks really cool. Now, I have heard nothing about this. I haven't even seen a single review, but I just got to try this game. It just looks so cool because it looks like it's getting that whole Robotech Gundam space battle with mecha Voltron thing in a board game format. It just looks great. I really want to try that. Uh, this is the one cheaper one, uh, Space Base. I might be able to get two copies for 50 bucks, but every time I talk about my love of Valeria, someone has to butt in and say, but Space Base. So I want to try it. I want to know, is it really better than Valeria? I love me some Valeria. So we want to see if Space Base is actually the better dice-based resource generation game. Next, I've got Coimbra. Uh, this is one of the best meaty Euros to come out in the last few years that's been on sale for the last few weeks. You can get it for under 50 bucks. One I really want to try. Uh, another one that was a Target exclusive. It actually came out while we still had Target in Windsor, and I actually went there a couple times trying to find this. But, of course, Target in Windsor didn't stock with Target in the state stocks, and that's Clask. Uh, this is a really unique kind of air hockey-ish looking dexterity game. I, I don't know. It looks gimmicky to me, but everyone that owns it loves it. Everyone talks about how it's one of their favorites, so I definitely want to try that out. Another Origins holdover, Battlestar Galactica Starship Battle Starter Set. Now, this one is like, you have to spend 50 bucks, you have to do it, as long as it's not my 50 bucks, because I'm probably wasting my money on this. But since seeing the game at Origins and watching a demo duel of two ships, I really want to try this game. It just looks really cool. The problem is, I'm sure, like, I don't play X-Wing or Armada now. When am I actually going to play Battlestar Galactica? I have no idea, but I want to check it out. I'll at least get Solon to play a couple games with me or something. Up next, Lorenzo Il Magnifico. This is another heavier game. People know I dig my heavy Euros. I have heard nothing but good things about this one, except Sean's opinion on the digital version, but I'm not going to hold that against the physical copy. And finally, another Feld, because I missed one, right? Uh, the last two years, I've been basically on a game buying embargo, right? I'm trying to get my games through work, through Tabletop Bellhop, and getting review copies. I missed over a Feld that came out called Oracle of Delphi. I just love Feld. Like, it, it's if a Feld comes out, I basically got to buy it. I got to try it. I totally, like, just, it came out in the middle of all stuff, and I never got a copy. All right. Well, that's quite the suggestion and uh, quite, quite the list there. Uh, Ryan does mention that uh, Tom Vass Vassal did review um, Starship Samurai. Uh, I'm sure people have. It's so just there was nothing there is, out there. There is some talk about it, but you're right. I don't think there's a lot. The uh, I'm, I'm looking here. There's only 470 reviews on Board Game uh, Geek, uh, which is yeah, pretty, that's low. pretty low. Yeah, I'll have to check out the Vassal review at some point. It just looks neat. It just looks like such a cool game, and I love the theme. I'm a big fan of those anime robot battles, right? Like, it, it, even going back to, like, Grandizer and all the, uh, the old Transor Z, and I don't know, big fan of the, the Japanese mecha anime, yep. something I grew up on. And, yeah, with the Lorenzo El Magnifico, it really could be a good game, but they really did a bad job on the version I played digitally. Uh, it, I mean, the game, I, I couldn't even tell if it was a good game or not because the <laughs> interface yeah. and everything about it was so badly done, in my opinion. 
I said that that's that's what people say. I've I've heard some the 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 digital down. People love the the board version. Yep. No, absolutely. There you go. That that was like thirty five games <laughs> you can get for under fifty bucks. So come on, Charles. I hope we got you covered there. Got to be at least one there you want to buy. All right. All right, if you've got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more. YouTube is building. We're doing more Twitch streams now. So now's the time to get in on the ground floor and say you were here when it all started. All right, we missed a lobby check-in. We should be checking in with the lobby after our main topic, and somehow that got cut out of the notes. But sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we released in the week previous, blog posts, new podcast episodes, anything else we create the week previous, we're going to let you know about. This week, it's going out on Thursday. That was intentional. I was going to put it out today. I decided to wait till tomorrow. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on the spot subscribe in the sidebar. Spot to subscribe. Yeah. That one's hard to say this week. <laughs> All right. Uh, just a reminder, no AMA, no live show next week. It's December 25th. I think there's something more important to do than come here and watch us. We'll be back to our regular schedule on January 1st for regular episodes with an AMA on the 29th. Yeah, January 1st, I'm assuming we should be good. I, I We will be busy on New Year's, but by 9 o'clock the next day, we should be good to record a podcast. Yep. I don't know what our topic will be. Maybe it'll <laughs> just be a New Year's Gaming in the New Year recap. Yep. But yeah, we should be back in two weeks. Heck, I have two weeks to write something, if not. <laughs> All right, do we want to jump back to the lobby? Sure. Oh, I missed that. That's ah, all right. All right, so uh, Ryan's had uh, some comments here in the lobby for us. Um, he's asking if Jamaica is under $50, and, well, it looks like the MSRP is over. Uh, Angie Games is telling us that uh, it's on sale right now. Personally, I would not recommend Jamaica. I had an extremely terrible experience with that game that was not fun at all, where one player just got ahead of everyone and won. They just kept going and couple of us in the back were playing cards on each other and there was this whole rock paper scissor thing i don't know i really did not enjoy jamaica when i played it mm. so i wouldn't recommend that one in the year of the dragon is a fantastic recommendation i didn't put it on the list because you can get it for like under 30 and to me that was just too low like i was trying to get stuff where you're like bang for your buck right i was trying to get the stuff that was like 49 bucks 45 bucks when making the list in the year of the dragon is actually one of my favorite felds of all time I love it. It's it's all about disaster mitigation. The Year of the Dragon must have been absolutely horrible for China because, wow, there's like fires and floods and revolts and all these terrible things happen. And it's all about trying to mitigate that. And I really enjoyed that twist because at the time, almost all the games you played were empire builders, right, where you're building stuff right. up, where this was more about your stuff's going to fall apart and trying to keep control. I really like that. So, right. yeah, I think that one's good. Now, Ryan's saying that Jamaica is a better game with more people, so... Yeah, that maybe that was the problem. I just, like, it was a bad enough experience. I wasn't even willing to try. Like, if I someone showed up as like, we're going to play Jamaica, there's five of us to play, give it another shot, I probably would. But the other people I played with, like, the guy who brought the game sold it after that oh, experience. Geez. Like, it wow. was that... Like, Scott brought it out, was really excited to get it, because I guess it was hard to get at the time. We played twice in the same night, and then the next time I saw Scott, he's like, no, I sold Jamaica. <laughs> So, yeah, it, it did not go over well. Yeah. I don't know if it was who we were playing with. People played it extremely competitively. Now, I think the game's more meant to be kind of silly, take that fun, and that's not how we played it. And like I said, there was a runaway leader problem. Like, there there was no chance anyone was going to win. Right. And I can't remember now how, but it felt random. Like, it was just like, oh, or because he was first player, he won. It was something like that. Right. And I noticed we you mentioned at the beginning that you know if you if he's looking for party games he's going to be d disappointed. Well, at least one thing to say is there are a lot of party games out there under fifty bucks. Oh, yeah. Um, like the like all the telestrations and you know code mm. names, they're all under fifty bucks, even in Canada. So that's definitely uh, yeah, that's, it's a that's totally different available. list. Like I'm I'm almost willing to revisit the topic to see how many good games you can get for fifty bucks. Yeah, like actually. like like, can you build a game night for fifty bucks? I think would be an interesting 
different way to look at that. But well, I think and that, we'll save that, that becomes a very different thing if, between Canada and America because well, yeah. <laughs> you got well, a really you hard should be doing, for your Canadian. You should have been doing 70. Yeah. Right. Like just the exchange rate, just by taking in the exchange, not just the MSRP difference. Yeah. But just just the the exchange rate, you should have been doing whatever 30 percent more on 50 is. Yeah. That's a rough guess of whatever that works out to 70 or 68 or whatever. <laughs> that probably would have made it a little more fair. Yeah, possibly. But uh, yeah, no, it's 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 tough to tough to spend 50 bucks uh, without wanting so much more here in Canada. Oh, yes. <laughs> But yeah, I, I think a $50 game night episode might be a, a cool one to do. Yep. Um, I did see Ryan noted Space Base and Valeria stand on their own merits, which is good to see. Yep. Um, coin broke. I haven't heard anything broken about it. So he's noting that the coin break keeps hearing there's something broken about it. I haven't heard that yet, <laughs> but I'm still way behind on podcasts. So maybe at that this point, people have figured that out. Uh, Deanna noted the Stranger Things Dungeons and Dragons role playing game starter set. I don't know. From what I hear, the adventure in there is so short that it's just not going to keep your group occupied for very long. Whereas the fan Delver is not a one shot. It's, it's very much a, like you could be playing it for a year. If your group doesn't meet that regularly, like it's a, it's a full campaign in a box almost like you're not getting to 20th level or anything, but it's also not just a sit down, do the one dungeon and you're done. Right. All right, I am not seeing... Uh, Ryan was asking uh, Agricola, all creatures all big and small. Fantastic two-player game. Uh, it's all the animal parts. It's all the building fences and upgrading your buildings a bit and building pens and the animal husbandry where you're going to produce kids without all the other messy stuff in Agricola. Uh, the only thing is it's a lot of small bits. So while I dig it as a two-player game, it's not great for Deanna and I because most of the time we play two-player games, we go to pubs or cafes and it's a lot of little tiny meeple and, and resource tokens and stuff like that. And I worry we're going to lose some pieces. But if you're playing two-player at home, I think it's great. Um, as for accessibility, it's probably pretty good because all the meeple are different shapes, but then there are the building tiles. It, it, I think it might be a good recommendation for you, Ryan. Uh, and just uh, looking at some stats on Coimbra, and there does indeed seem to be a color and uh, player order problem in the game okay um that is skew that is statistically skewing the game oh that's that's sad to see yeah uh what and you know how much that will actually affect you is a different is is a different thing but the statistics are showing some skewing yeah that's it's one of those games you probably have to play it a lot before you see it but yeah fair enough yeah that that's i'm, I'm catching up on podcasts but i'm still nowhere near god <laughs> All right. All right. I'm just going to finish off by saying, I know we say it multiple times throughout the show, but if you got a question, please send us your questions. Questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, we mean it. We're, we're not at the bottom of the barrel. We do have questions, but it's getting, we're getting a little picky now and then. There, there's some that, you know, we think of appropriate questions. There's some questions we have that aren't the best questions, and there's some stuff we've already covered. I, we can only answer what are the best two player X so many times. <laughs> so, We've got a we got a lot of repeat style questions. We could use some we could use some fresh blood, some fresh questions. Would love to see some new questions from everyone. We're here to answer your questions, but it only works if we've got your questions to answer. And now a review of Tower of Madness. Tower of Madness was designed by Kurt Covert and published by his own company, Smirk and Dagger Games. Features art by E.J. Delacruz. Jen Santos, and Brian Valenza. It was originally published in 2018, though I do remember seeing it at Origins in 2017. They're really showing it off, but I guess it was officially released in 2018. Now, for anyone out there who hasn't watched your unboxing video, how about you tell us what's in the box? All right. First off, though, go watch that unboxing video. Seriously, if you haven't, uh, Deanna, it's her favorite video that I've ever recorded. Uh, just fast forward to about 15 minute mark or so and watch the part about sticky dice to see why it's her favorite. I mean, just the fact that we're talking about sticky dice right here says something. What? I'm yeah. not sure, but it says something. Yeah, uh, we'll get back to those dice in a moment. So first thing you're going to find in the box, it's a long box. A little minor complaint. This is not easy to stock on your shelf. This isn't going to fit in your Calyx. Uh, I guess it has to be this size because of the tower size. But uh, it's one I, I hate. I don't know. I, I wish the board game industry would come up with a few standard box sizes and stick to it. 
I'm not going to really blame Smirk and Dagger for that, though. But you open up the box, you find the rules. Uh, it's only seven pages, uh, but man, there is a lot of text. It's almost a wall of text. There are a good number of examples, but just uh, the rules are very exception-based. So it's like, you do this, except when this happens. And you do this, except when this card happens. Uh, they're clear enough. They're clear enough overall, but we did find ourselves referencing the rules quite a bit, like for the first two to three games. Like it was a, wait, how's this work? Or wait, how does that happen? Now, what I would like to have seen is some kind of summary too. So we wouldn't have to flip through the rule book because there's spell cards, there's um, the investigator card powers, then there's all of the, I forget what they're called, and I know it's later in the notes, but the, the cards you get if you roll two oak branches, I forget what they're called, but um, I would have liked to have seen those. Unnatural influence tiles, that's what it is. Uh, it, it would, and even the marble colors. Just give me one sheet. Like, like just the back of the rule book would have worked. Make it eight pages and just give me a summary. Um, other complaint is my rule book came bent. It was actually tucked into the side of the box, tucked between the side of the box and the insert, which was a bit disappointing. Of course, doesn't affect gameplay, but just when you get a new game, I, I want, you know. Yeah. Now, it's not may not be a huge deal to casual players, but it's a major faux pas for collectors, and it can impact the readability as well. In this case, I don't. I don't think it really got in the way. It just personally, like, I, I guess I'm enough of a collector. Yeah. I didn't buy a ding and dent copy. I was just like, oh, that sucks. Uh, next is a bag full of tentacles. Uh, these are nice green plastic. It seems it, it's slightly flexible. Doesn't seem like they're too fragile. It doesn't seem like they're gonna break easily. Definitely not gonna break just like using them appropriately. Probably not gonna break if you whack your friends with them. Now, if I recall, there was one missing, but they quickly replaced it for you. Yeah, there was. Um, I didn't realize this till the end of the unboxing. I tried to put everything together. I freaked out for a bit thinking I misplaced it while I was doing the unboxing because I did take a tentacle out and wave it at the camera. Rewatched my own unboxing video to confirm. No, I put it back in the box. Uh, no, there was, uh, but there was one missing, which in this style of game, to me meant the game was unplayable. I literally did not want to play it until I had the tentacle because while well, the tentacles hold the marbles in and it's for plunk, right? Like taking one out does affect how things are going to fall. Um, they did do a, a great job. Like I contacted Kurt Colvert, uh, who's really good, uh, especially on Twitter, like great social media presence, really easy to get a hold of. They did quickly replace it. Well, quickly enough, shipping to Canada sucks sometimes. But yeah, I did get a replacement copy at no cost to me. Um, I didn't mention the rule book. I probably could have got a replacement rule book at the same time. Uh, next is the tower itself and like uh the roof, the topper. Uh, I gotta say this thing's nice, like really nice. Uh, it's it's a nice thick piece with like folding so it folds flat. It's got some nice tower artwork on it. Uh, the holes for the tentacles are color coded to show you how to put the the tentacles in. And the one thing like I I don't know how I missed it in the unboxing video because I I even see it when watching it is it's magnetic, which is fantastic. Like you just fold it out and it snaps together. Now I have no idea in twenty years or ten years from now if that magnet's gonna hold up, but right now it's great. Like. There's, there's no, you know, insert tab A or anything here. You just hold this thing together and snap. There you go. And the roof is a little more fiddly. Um, I actually fumbled with it quite a bit before I noticed online it's also magnetic, and I just hadn't put the pieces in the right way to get them to attract. Uh, but, oh, man, you can get that tower without the tentacles in it set up in seconds. Yeah, it's unfortunate that uh, things like gizmos weren't assembled with magnets and yeah. could avoid some of the problems we had with that, uh, that build. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, much better like component quality. I got to say, it beats out Potion Explosion and Gizmos and um, Secret of Monte Cristo being other games with you know fancy components like this. Right. Uh, under the tower itself is the base for it. This is a nice, hefty chunk of black plastic. Tower fits snugly on it. it, um, it it's not WYSIWYG. Like you could technically assemble it the wrong way, but it just means it's turned the wrong way. Uh, the sculpting's nice. It's got like elder signs and archaic stuff, and there's some little spots to put green marbles when they come out. I have nothing to complain about here. One thing I thought they might have done is I talk about how much I love Shogun and Wallenstein. And one of the things they did in that game is they made the the, the base of the tower clear so all the players could see it. That might have been a, a valid choice here, so you could see it from across the board. But really, it's not that big a deal because once the marbles fall, you tend to pull them all out anyway. Yeah. No, absolutely, and it's a you know, this is one of those games. We talk about table presence with games. This game has got it in spades. It it looks great. Uh, you know, it's easy to assemble. It's 
something you want to have out at a game night in, uh, yeah. for that for that part, purpose alone it's gonna pull people in yeah it's great uh, under the base is a bunch of baggies with counters and tokens what was cool is they're pre-punched uh tokens are nice and thick uh there's some player boards those came like wrapped in cardboard uh they're the same nice thickness and they're also already punched out so that's a bonus uh the player boards kind of look like like a two-layer player board that would hold everything in place, but it's just one layer, so the table ass is the bottom, like that's all notches to hold everything, so that's cool. Holds the marbles well. At that, they're well designed. Yeah, I haven't seen uh, too many marbles shooting around, and when this was yeah. getting played. Now, next is the marbles. Uh, these are literal marbles. This isn't like Gizmo's little plastic round things. These are cat's eye style marbles in white, blue, red, and green, and yellow. Um, way more white, red, and blue. Uh, only one yellow, three green. Uh, these are the marbles I grew up with. Like these, they're marbles. Want to go out in the playground and shoot some marbles afterwards? <laughs> you can. Yeah, no, I don't know. What do you call the big one? No shooter. No shooter. No, no shooter. Um, there's a set of location cards. Uh, these are square cards. They've got nice Cthulhu looking landscape art. There is some text and icons on them that's nice and clear, large text. You can see it from across the table. Uh, the points they're worth is especially large, so that's cool. Uh, there's one more deck of cards that has character cards and spell cards. Uh, the spell cards are notable because they're like divided in half and half of it is written upside down because you read the card one way if you're sane and the other way if you're insane. No complaints here. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, they've really put a lot of effort into making this game nice on the table. Yep. Then we get to the sticky dice. Yes, sticky the dice that came in my copy of Tower of Madness were stuck together by some unknown substance. Like, if you watch the video, you can see me pull them out and then hold them by one die as they sit there vertically hanging in space. Um, they did come apart easily enough, with, but th they were coated in something. Uh, something sticky enough that, like, you could touch it with a finger and pick up a die. I, it was gross. It, it is, was... Um, this one I complained about. This this was this was enough that I was like, ew. And I went online, I was like, ew. And Kurt got a hold of me and was like, oh yeah, this is a known manufacturing issue. Just clean them with soap and water and clean it off. I, I gotta say, it took a lot of soap and water. Um, I did it at home, brought the game out while we were playing. One of the players was like, these are still a little tacky. So I brought them in the washroom and washed them again. And then we were still playing and they were still a little tacky. So then I let them soak while we played another game. Uh, they're there seem to be clean now. So, so wrong. So yeah. very, very wrong. Yeah, uh, yeah. I wasn't actually expecting my sanity to be tested while unboxing a game. Uh, now, all this stuff is in a nice solid black plastic vacuum, whatever you call it, not vacuum seal, whatever that's how you inject in, it's not inject and molding, whatever that plastic, how you make plastic inserts. Uh, it does a great job of holding all the components. Everything fits back into the box great. The tower unfolds great. Um, game will store vertically or horizontally. You're going to get a lot of rattling noise as you move the marbles around, but it, other than that, it works great. Overall, uh, just based on the unboxing, I think Kurtz, Merck and Dagger, they need to have some words with their manufacturer. Like, come on. I, Bent rule book is annoying. That's that's kind of annoying. I, I guess that's okay, but, like, yeah, it sucks. Sticky dice, though, that's just gross. And then the fact I didn't even have a complete game. I was missing a tentacle. So now I have an unplayable game with sticky dice and a bent rule book. I, by the time I had this done unboxing, I was pretty disenchanted with the game before even playing it. Well, now that we know what you get and how to clean it off, <laughs> how do you play? Well, first thing you got to do when you play Tower of Madness is build the tower. Uh, this is not fun. Uh, unlike Kerplunk, where you just shove... The, the things in anywhere because it's just a big round dome thing and other people can help you. There are specific holes you have to fill on each side of the tower. And like that still doesn't sound bad until you try to do it and can't get them through. I got to admit the first couple times it took me forever. And then I learned the trick of looking through the top to see what you were doing. So that got a little easier, but that only works for some of the sides because you can't really load the bottom while you're looking from the top. Um, it's just not fast. Like it, it takes a long time to, to put these tentacles in this tower. Yeah. You know, this, again, people, people talk about this and, and, and we'll talk a little more later about the whole Kerplunk comparison, um, which is wrong in a number of ways. And unfortunately setting up is one of those ways. Yeah. 
Now, once you actually start playing, you're going to select an investigator. You see the location deck based on the number of players and throw the clock tower location on top. On your turn, you roll the hopefully no longer sticky dice. Uh, you then look at your dice and you have to choose one, at least one of those dice to lock on your player board. The player board has spots for five dice. Um, there are three specific ones that are looking for a gate symbol, a heart symbol, and a mind symbol. And the other two spots can be filled with any dice. So you're going to roll your dice. You're going to slot at least one. You're going to roll your dice again, try to slot another. You keep doing that until you either can't slot something and you fail, or you've slotted all five dice and you've conceded, you've succeeded at your investigation. So to succeed, you're going to need a heart, a mind, and a gate. And then your other two dice, you're just going to look at the numbers on them. So they're like standard D6 that way that they have one to six on them. The score you get for succeeding in the investigation is based on those two dice. Now, if you fail to slot all your dice, something horrible happens, and that's when you pull a tentacle from the tower. After you're done your turn, whether you succeed or fail, it goes to the next player. They do the same thing. They roll the dice or they pull a tentacle. You go around the whole board. Then you look at those investigation scores, those two dice for the players who succeeded. Whoever has the highest score gets the location card, which is worth points. So, keep... so it's, it, it's really not Kerplunk at all. No. <laughs> this is, you know, again, you look at this game and you see Kerplunk. But Not at all. the game doesn't involve the tower. <laughs> Not really. It's 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 there. It's a thing. Yeah. So you keep playing until all the locations are gone, or three green marbles have fallen from the tower. If three green marbles come out, you lose the game. Now about the tentacles. When you're pulling tentacles, there's a chance some marbles will fall. Now, this isn't a bad thing. And actually, early in the game, you want marbles to fall on your turn. And depending on the color of the marbles that fall out depends on what they do. So green marbles are terrible. I mentioned those. You get three of those, the entire group loses the game. That is, unless the person that causes the last one to fall out happens to be insane, then they win. Like I said, the rules are very exception-based. It's this way, except when. So in that case, the, the, the insane person wins. Hasn't happened in a single game we played. Blue marbles, when they come out, are discovery marbles. They're just worth three points each, so they're good. And those are like one-third of the marbles in the tower. White marbles are just as good. They give you spells. Spells are cards that let you break the rules. Uh, typical of Spurk and Dagger games, these are very take that. It's make someone draw an extra tentacle, re-roll someone else's dice, change the number on a die. Um, and they depend on if your investigator is sane or insane, what you do with them. Now, red marbles are the bad ones that aren't the green ones. They represent insanity. If you ever get four red marbles, your character becomes insane. You now use the insane side of the spell cards, and on your turn, instead of rolling the dice, you just pull tentacles, hoping to end the game by dropping that last green marble. Now, added to that, there's a bunch of little special rules. Again, there's a lot of exception-based playing here, where each location is going to have some rules which will say, oh, when you roll these symbols, this happens, or plays played in reverse order or something. Uh, the spells all change things. The investigators, if you're playing with the advanced rules, have special powers that are unique to each one, making the game asymmetric. I strongly recommend if you're gamers to start with that. Um, the other thing, though, are if you roll two fives, which are these Elder Oak symbols, you get to take an unnatural influence token, which is another way where you can spend these tokens to break the rules. And again, it's like re-roll the dice, cancel another player's spell, and so on. If players manage to get to the bottom of the location deck, the sane investigator with the most points wins. If they don't, everyone loses. Yep. It's, uh, so far, people who looked at this box keep saying Cthulhu Kerplunk. Uh, and it, you know, again, it really looks that way. The, there's so much of, about it that looks like a, a simple Kerplunk game, and it's just not. Um, yeah. Unfortunately between the dice and the marbles, uh, as Angie Games is pointing out, the randomness on this game is really high. It is. It is. Now, that's what you expect from Smirk and Dagger, but I don't know. Uh, so the first thing I got to say, I am really happy. It's not just Cthulhu, Kerplunk. I, I actually thought when I saw this game, it was literally going to be on your turn, pull a tentacle, marbles follow, see what happens. That's what I thought it was going to be. And I'm glad it's not. That's not it. It's not just every turn, pull a tentacle and see what happens. There is a actually rather solid push your luck dice game here, hiding behind the gimmicky tower that catches everyone's attention. Like this dice game is quite fun and can be very tense. You're like, oh, I just am I am I gonna get a six or am I gonna get my mind? I gotta get the mind. 
or do I lock this or do I know what I, like, if you roll two sixes on your first turn, you really want to lock those to try to get the 12 points, but you're greatly reducing your chance of getting the three symbols you need to succeed. Like it's a really tense game. Like it's better than some recent dice games we've reviewed without mentioning any games. I would go so far to say that this dice mechanic is probably clever enough to have been its own game. They probably could have done a pusher luck dice Cthulhu game just with that mechanic. The problem though, is that doing well at this push your luck game means you don't get to do the thing that's supposed to be fun about Tower of Madness. You don't get to play with the tower. Like, that's that's what draws everyone to this game, is this gimmicky tower, right? If you're playing well, you roll the dice and mark your score and then pass it on and hope someone doesn't roll better than you. When someone fails, all of a sudden they're having all this fun and they're pulling tentacles and everyone's looking at the marbles. Meanwhile, you're sitting back going, well, I got a 12 score. I'm awesome. I, I, not only that, but pulling things from the tower is definitely more fun than just rolling the dice. But then there's the fact that most of the, di the, the marbles are good, right? So not only is it more fun to pull from the tentacle, you're going to get points from pulling the tentacle and it's a great way to get points on your own. So basically in this game, you're punished for succeeded, succeeding and rewarded for failing. Yep. Then, then there's the physics of the tower. So you can't play this game cautiously. Well, you can, but if you do, you're playing it wrong. If you actually play this like Kerplunk, where you're trying to make it so marbles don't fall. So you're only pulling those top tentacles and maybe at the very beginning, you pull a bunch from the very bottom because you know there's no marbles sitting on them yet. You're actually playing wrong. You're going to have nothing fall but most of the marbles are good, right? So you want, so you want to try to make sure they fall. The other thing though, is this is the, the grid this makes is not as stable as the, the Kerplunk grid of sticks through there. And I find once one marble falls, you tend to get a deluge. You don't get just two or three. You'll tend to get a ton. And then when a ton come out, it's almost always, you get all three of the green ones come out and the game ends. Yep. Uh, and in the, Chat room, Mage Kayla was pointing out uh, she pulled two tentacles and got three green marbles, and uh, you know, right away, you know, yeah, <laughs> and, and and that's it. And it's game over. Game over. Oh, we all lost. Yep. Like, like I have had really mixed results with this game. Most gamers I play with, like like people who like euros, people like heavy games, they enjoy the dice mechanic, and they like trying to gather the location cards and and using the mechanics on the investigation, and using the spells to get more dice but then are way too cautious when it comes from pulling from the tower. They're just like, no, no, I don't want to ruin my score. I don't want to go insane. I got my thing going on. Now, non-gamers are completely the opposite. They have a hard time grasping the push your luck aspect. Like I have had to explain the rules multiple times. Look, no, no, you need a heart. No, no, you need a mind. Why do I want to keep these dice? We well, want to keep them for this. Wait, you roll two fives. What happens? Like they kind of get lost in it, but they have a ton of fun pulling things from the tower, right? But then they don't tend to use their spell cards well, and they don't do well on their dice. They don't they don't play the, the odds very well and tend to not win, right? Because they're too busy things. Now, the most success I've had is actually with a mix because it kind of balances each other out, right? Where the, the people playing the, the dice game are doing their thing and the people playing the tower game are doing their thing. And it kind of balances the game out and it, it works out okay. The problem is if you play to win, you don't have the fun part. You're, you're, you're doing probabilities in your head and pushing your like in a dice game and trying to score the points and you don't do the fun thing. And like, you get this awesome feeling where you're like, I got all my thing. I rolled a Yahtzee. I rolled a one, two, three, and two sixes is the best thing you can possibly roll at this game. That should be a moment where everyone's high-fiving each other, right? That should be a, yay, I win. Instead, it's like, yeah, I got 12. It's your turn. Like my turn's just done. It, like it, it just, it's boring. Yep. Now I gotta admit, overall, I, I, I'm. It's cool. The Tower of Madness is more of a game than I thought it would be. Like I am, I honestly glad it's not just C Cthulhu Cyberpunk, but like it's a game that's at cross purposes with itself. Like it's, it's like it's fighting itself. It, it doesn't. Agree, the, the mechanics don't match the fun. I do this. I personally can't suggest anyone rush out and pick this game up. I, to me, this is a very much a try before you buy. Now I have met people who love it. There are there are people in our local gaming group that have had a great time with this game. There are definitely people out there I've seen online that enjoy the game, and there are people out there that are going to like this. I just wasn't one of them. 
in the end, I think I either wanted a sillier, lighthearted game, like a beer and pretzels, lots of take that and laughing and playing powers on each other and making someone have to pull three times and skipping turns, more of like almost a rhino hero kind of take that game. Or I wanted something more in depth, where if you fail, uh, the push your life, luck dice thing, that you're actually getting punished by pulling. Like you don't want to pull from the tower. You don't want marbles to fall. And I find Tower of Madness isn't at either of those extremes and it's kind of in the middle. And for me, it fell pretty flat in the middle. Yeah, and I think part of the part of the problem with this game is expectations. Um, I, I suspect that a lot of the people who have really enjoyed this game at the club have no idea what they're doing and they just sit down and play and they didn't pay for it. Uh, yes. You know, it's not, you know, it's not their game. They don't have any buy-in. Uh, so they can just sit and have fun with it for what it is. Uh, whereas I think if you've invested in this game, if you put in time, if you've, or if you, if you've thought too much about it or all, <laughs> at all about it, um, then you're not going to get what you thought about and what you wanted necessarily. Uh, I, it's a great game. I think this is a sort of game where every FLGS should have a copy that they can yeah. put out at game night. Um, but no, I, there, I, there aren't that many people I can think of who I would suggest buy this game. Um, now I suspect there's probably house ruling that could be done and that could yep. create a better game out of this, but how many people buy a game so you can house rule it? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's other. I'll admit while playing, um, Sebastian, a local gamer, had a ton of suggestions on how to improve this game. Oh, absolutely. Because he was very disappointed in it in the way that, like, I don't know what he was expecting. I actually don't know which side of the, if he expected <laughs> Cthulhu or Punk or Elder Sign with a tower. with like As the two extremes, I don't know what he expected, but, man, he was, it just, you could tell he was frustrated by the game while playing it. And he's just, but if just you did this, or if just you did that, or if just, he's like, and, he, and one of his thoughts was, no matter what, you pull a tentacle on your turn. That was if that's you my fail, first you thought. Pull three or yeah. something, right? You that, pull two. That's my first thought. Is or you have if you to succeed, pull tentacles. if you succeed, you pull a tentacle but ignore reds. Yeah, right or something, right? So you can yeah. still get spells and discovery points. Like and and Sebastian was coming up with all these ways. And personally, I, my opinion was put the game away and let's go play something more fun. Yeah. Right? I, I I'm like I don't feel the need to fix this game. Like I said I don't want to bash it too much. The, there are people who loved it. It definitely was not for me. And and and, and like I said I don't even know what I would have preferred. I think I would have preferred a Go Cuckoo, a sillier dexterity based. Because that's the other thing, too, with this compared to compared to Plunk, because you can't see the marbles. Right. Your Plunk has more strategy in your poles because you can see what's resting on what. Right. It's a it's a clear tower. This is not. So you have no clue when you're pulling a marble if something's going to fall or not. Yeah. Where even if it had a clear tower, at least maybe then you could be like, ooh, there's a green there. And if I'm the insane player, I can try to make that fall. I don't know. Again, yeah. I'm trying to fix a game that, that yeah. at this point. I'll now, push we should also mention, uh, not included in the rule book are suggestions on how to load the tower that were given yes. to you by the game designer. And that's concerning. If he has, you know, tips and tricks on how you can better load the tower, um, yeah. those should be in the game. Those shouldn't be oh, something passed around between friends. So that's maybe something that he realized once the game was released. So, like, we have talked about this on the show, Kurt as I said, is very good at social media, noticed us talking about it, uh, read my some of my original thought reviews, and did note that one of the best ways is to um, only put half the tentacles in, then put half the marbles in, then put the rest of the tentacles in so that you get a better distribution. One of the things I tried that did not work was putting the three green marbles in last. I kind of thought that would put them at the top, but I, that seemed to make them fall out quicker, something to do with the physics inside the tower. Because that was my thought. Is I'm like, I'm going to seed this so the three green marbles go in last. Right. Yeah, no, it's uh it's an interesting one. Well, for more in-depth, uh more in-depth look at Tower of Madness, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews. Yeah, I go into a bit more detail on how to play and the different cards and stuff like that. I didn't want to get into every little symbol on the die. Like why the elder sign matters on the six. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletop? All right, every week we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's been going on. Uh, not too much of it for me, but you've had a pretty good uh, run. 
Yeah, it's been a while. We, we've been busy with Black Friday and other stuff going on. I finally got some actual gaming in here. So this might go a little longer than it has the last couple of weeks. So Saturday was a CG Realm game night. Uh, game of the night was Rhino Hero, which I have no idea why CG Realm suddenly stocked full of Rhino Hero. I don't know where that came from. Um, they actually, Haba had provided demo copies, which is pretty awesome. So nice. I don't know where it came from. But as we learned at Extra Life, this is Tori's new favorite game. And I gave Tori and Kat a heads up. I'm like, hey, we're doing Rhino Hero, kind of as a joke. Not only did they show up, they brought Tori's mom. So I thought that was kind of cool. And that actually went really well. Like, I, I I don't mean it to sound silly that Tori, like, my mother-in-law loves coming out to game night, too. They, they're they definitely gamers. And we've talked about Azul and Tori's mom before. So would Tor, is this a Tori, Tori's mom game? So they actually brought Tori's mom out, which was awesome. And it went really well. And I think she had a good time. So I'm hoping she'll come back. Uh, future weeks at CG Realm. And uh, actually, just uh, just jumping back a little bit, I've just been checking, and I found the thread on Board Game Geek for Sticky Dice. That see, <laughs> I'm, it has to be there. Yeah, but I, it's, it, it was gross. Yeah, but you got to watch the video. You get my real time reaction to, to the, the dice. It's it's pretty good. It's clippable. All right. So first few games we played, of course, Saturday were Rhino Hero. Uh, we actually had three copies of the game out that night, which was impressive for a demo night. Um, uh, Rhino Hero is a solid kid's dexterity game. Uh, it's kind of like building a house of cards. Uh, you have cards or walls that are just cards folded in half, and these are like pretty much standard playing card style cards. And each turn, you're going to put one or two of these folded walls down and then add a roof. Now, the roof comes from a hand of cards you get at the beginning of the game, which is standard as five. Goal of the game is to play all your cards. Uh, that's very similar to you, Uno. So is the fact that these rooftops have symbols on them and they'll have stuff like you skip a turn. Uh, after I play my roof, you have to draw an extra card or now we're going to change the order of play. Now, where the name of the game comes in is that some of the roofs will have a rhino hero symbol on it. Now, there's this little tiny rhino superhero meeple in the game that's like the cutest thing ever. So I do think it's funny the superhero has a picture of himself on his chest. I thought that was cute. Uh, when a rhino hero card is played, the next player has to put the walls on, then find the rhino hero meeple somewhere in the tower or off like, the first time it's off the table. But like it's usually on the tower and then pick it up and put it on to this spot on the card. So basically you're trying to build this car tower and then you got to put this heavy meeple on it, which is one of the unique parts of the game. First player to play all their cards wins unless someone knocks over the tower and then it's the player with the least cards that wins. I, it's that simple. You just learned how to play Rhino Hero. A uh, silly fun game that I really dig and man, it went over well at the event. Like like Tori, Sleepy Tori loved it at Extra Life. But that was Sleepy Tori. Sleepy Tori loves everything. This was Awake Tori, and oh man, I have never seen him smile so much as playing Rhino Hero with his mom. Uh, we actually got to the end of the game. Like, we literally ran out of cards. We had it, so Tori's mom played her last card, and there weren't enough walls to go around, which I hadn't noticed before. The game's designed so that someone will run out of cards before then. Yeah. And, and we had gotten a tower as high as it could go, so that was cool. But we did take three tries before we got that far. <laughs> Yeah, and I have to say, this one's not for me. I am I am a shaky hand person, and uh, as we learned on Extra Life, Rhino Hero is not my game. No, uh, it's not for everyone. Dexterity games aren't for everyone. Although you're you're fine with hamster rolls. So. I, oh, I love dexterity uh, games in general, but yeah. card building games. I have never yeah. built a card tower or card house in my life. Yeah. So <laughs> now, what I really want to try, and I, I was going to put it in my under fifty list, is Rhino Hero Super Battle where you're like building a whole city and there's multiple meeple. That's about yeah. all I know. It looks really cool. I would have liked it better if, if CG had gotten that in instead of right. Rhino here. All right. Up next, I broke out horrified mainly because Tori really wanted to show it off to his mom. So we played five players, Tori, Kat, Tori's mom, Deanna, and I, and I probably should have remembered her name. Deanna might, might've been Lynn. Sorry. Um, this was one of the most brutal games of horrified I've ever played. We had terrible luck. Like, Two players, uh, Deanna and Kat, died before even having their first turn. Like, they, their meeples were, their the meeples, not meeple, their standees were out on the board, and before they even got to do a single thing, a monster had moved next to them and killed them. Uh, like, that's something that was, like, hadn't come up before, and I almost feel like needs a house rule. Like, like that's two players who didn't even get to go before they died. Now, if, uh, 
I mean, you just respawn on your turn, though, correct? So yeah, you respawn, you respawn at the in the hospital, but the threat level goes up, right? So right. our threat level basically started at three by the time right. we got around the table once. Now, the rest of the game continued kind of in the same vein. Like, we just died over and over and over again until terror level maxed out. Like, Deanna died three times. One round, a villager spawned on the same spot as a monster to die the turn they spawned. Where, like, literally, there was nothing we could do. Like, it was just this card played, you put them out, then that monster attacks that person who just came out, and they died. Like, pfft, done. Yeah. I'm like, come on. Like, like, at least make a rule that the person doesn't spawn if there's a monster on the space. Like, that's just pure dumb luck. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I, like I, I don't mind difficulty in a co-op game, but we shouldn't lose just due to pure dumb luck. Yeah. Now I gotta admit, like it didn't bug me that much. Like I've I've had enough good experiences and close calls and horrified that having that one game that went terrible due to luck, I I guess we were probably due. But I gotta say the other players weren't too happy with this. Cat in particular really didn't enjoy the game at all. I uh, and she noted that it felt overly long and pointless because way too early in the game we knew we were gonna lose. And then sure enough we did. So we just sat there and moved our pieces for an hour and a half, only to confirm that, yep. We didn't defeat a single monster, and we predicted that. Well, and then, and unfortunately, that's one of those games where, yeah, you know, it's it's always hard. You, but just call it, you know. <sighs> the problem is in a co-op game like that, it still feels like you have that chance, right? And if we had come yeah. back and got a win, it would have been like, oh, that was amazing. We were doing yeah. so bad at the beginning. So I don't know. Yeah. Like, yeah. If if I could have saw the future and know we were going to lose <laughs> for sure, I maybe we would have called it. Yeah. Uh, the, the big thing that was interesting here that I think we're talking about is just how different this was from any other previous game of Horrified. Every other time we played, I'm like, man, this is the new pandemic. This is the new co-op game. This is fantastic. Like losing in a co-op is normal, right? You should, or else they're no fun. And I usually don't mind, but it was just the fact that there was nothing we could do about it. Like, like it wasn't our strategy. It wasn't how we played. It wasn't the decisions we made. It was just dumb luck that we basically had no chance. Now, maybe it was just a fluke, but it didn't feel like it. It seemed like this is something that could happen in Horrified, depending on the, like, the draw deck and the order things happen. Uh, it does sound, uh, and, and Deanna mentions this in the chat room, uh, this could be a player count problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you've got five players, you've got that many more locations that the monsters can get to where something's going to happen. Um you know, Plus the number of times the monsters are going to activate before you get to go. Yeah. Because that was the other thing, right? Like, so here's here's an example. We had someone with five weapons die because so many other players got to go before that player did. So they started yeah. the turn in a spot with a monster. I, I think it was Frankenstein. They have five weapons. Like you figure they're great. Well, on the next player's turn, Frankenstein activated. And then, you know, rolled two hits. So two of those are gone. And then the Frenzied Monster activated, which happens to be Frankenstein, because Frankenstein had the lowest thing. And then there goes another item. Then on the next person's turn, say Dracula activated. There wasn't Dracula, but whatever. The Invisible Man activated. Then the next player's turn, Frankenstein activates again, and again rolls two hits, so two more items are gone. And like by the time it got back to that player, they had died. Right. Yeah, no, that's... it's. I, I, definitely, I definitely believe that them, that may be strongly a player count issue that we just hadn't run into without yeah. playing the full count. The last time we played with five players, we won, but that, I've only done that the one more. Does Board Game Geek have a, a recommended that yet? Uh, you know what? I haven't checked. Let me uh, take a quick peek. Because I know before it wasn't there, but the game was still pretty new, so it takes a certain number of votes before that shows yeah. up. Uh, and as of right now, we show best of three. Yeah, and yeah, so so maybe that's it. Yep. And in that case, don't put five in the box. <laughs> if it's yep. that bad at five, if that's going to happen. So I don't know, I, one bad experience, but I, I do actually feel slightly guilty having put out, you know, our official review and not having had this problem before. Now, note this took, like, I don't know, this was play six or seven. Like, this is yep. it's not like we didn't play the game enough before. Yeah. But yeah, I was surprised. This this was literally a bad experience with Horrified. And I, I felt bad because Tori's mom played for the first time and definitely wasn't overly impressed. Right. Tori still loved it, but it's it's his jam. It's his, yeah, uh, he yeah. loves classic horror and he loved what happened and losing his part for the course and hey. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, the last game I played on Saturday was a three-player game of Carpe Diem. This is the Steppenfeld from Aaliyah Ravensburger. Uh, Deanna and I, were going to try a two-player. But Ian happened to wander over and actually seemed curious about it. So I invited him to play. 
And it ended up he loved it. Now, I personally didn't think I would ever sell Ian on a Steffenfeld game. He's definitely more of a either highly thematic game, like he loves Cthulhu Death May Die, he's played it now, or a casual game. Like that's just what he's, he's more of a role player, to be honest. He's really into role playing games. But as far as board games go, he wants, you know, a nice light game, maybe an abstract strategy game where he wants something highly thematic. I didn't expect this dry Euro to pull him in, and man, he loved it. Uh, game went really well. I had only played once before, but man, the teach went a little better. This is We talked about this last week, how I like to play everything with Deanna at least once before I present it in public, and we had played the week previous with Deanna and Sean from Hamilton, or Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton. Um, so I had played before. It, it Man, that game's actually not bad to teach at all. Uh, for a Feld especially, right? For the amount of stuff that's going on. And there's a player board that I found extremely useful while teaching the rules. Uh, just being able to point to the different colors and the iconography is actually really solid. Having now played and seen it all work. Uh, first time looking at it, I was a little overwhelmed. I'm well, not overwhelmed is not the right word, but it's just like, I don't know, a bunch of icons. So yeah, I, it, it, it's good. And again, Ian picked this up really quick. Uh, he was making comparisons to Carcassonne and Tiny Towns during the teach. The actual game went pretty good. Um, played part of the game um, much better than the last time I played, uh, especially planning for scoring, because I was terrible at that. On the, the, the first time I played, I did a lot better at planning ahead for scoring, but I did terrible at laying out my board this time. I actually managed to make it so there were some tiles I could not ever place. So that kind of, <laughs> that, that was just me planning badly. Um, one thing that was cool was the border was very different. I didn't realize how much the randomizing the border was going to change the game. Last time I played, I had like a mix, right? Like I, I basically had like every building type, every field was on my boards and I just had to put them in the right spot. This time I had almost all buildings and the only field I actually cared about was grapes. So that was interesting to see how that changed my strategy. Cool. Well, it sounds like it's, uh, it's, it's sticking out as a, uh, a solid game. Not, not surprisingly. I mean, I think we all knew that it was going to uh, be one of those games that you wanted to keep in your uh, in your rotation. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, you know, it's 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 staying solid, and you're finding new new interesting things about it, which I yeah. think is a nice feature about any game. No, oh, I'm digging it. Yeah, Carpe Diem solid. Uh, it was a Spiel nominee, and I think it's well deserved. I'm possibly even disturbing the wind. I haven't played uh, Wingspan yet. Wingspan's what beat it out. I know everyone's loving that game, but yeah, yeah it's solid. absolutely. Uh, All right. So what are we are we gonna what are we gonna do with this next one? I know we're. I don't know how much time do we kill it. We didn't start till nine twenty, and I don't know how long the coffee break was. Okay, we've got time. we've probably got time then. We All haven't right. done we haven't had long episodes lately anyway. So that's true. <laughs> I'll, I'll you know what I'll cut down on what I got written here. But um, the last thing I want to talk about, in my opinion, the best for last, what I think people are going to be most curious about. But that's just me because I have a huge nostalgia for this is our glorious friend computer. Uh, a few months ago, I was approached by a PR company and asked if I wanted to review Paranoia. Happiness is mandatory for PC. And I agreed and I finally got to check that out on Sunday. I actually live streamed the game probably the, about the first four hours and 15 minutes of the game. Uh, yeah, so, I, and this, is, uh, this has been announced for a while. It is Epic Game Store only. Uh, they've, they're exclusive for a full year, so you won't be able to get it on Steam uh, until twenty twenty, uh, the end of twenty twenty. Yeah, it's uh, like December. Uh, and there is no Mac version at this point. All right. Yeah, no app version either, as far as I can tell, even planned. I don't think they're going to be doing an Android or an iOS. Not likely. All right. So the big thing I don't want to talk about is the story, because this is very much a single player game. Uh, there is no online play. There's no playing parties. Uh, you actually play a single character, which did surprise me. And it so far has a very linear plot. And I don't want to give away that plot. But I will say this game nails, like, everything. Paranoia. Like, like absolutely everything. The, the aesthetic, the look. Um, it It is paranoia. Like, from the opening scene of your clone being born, to every bit of dialogue, to the social interactions, to the random stuff happening in the background. Like, they had, did an amazing job of capturing the look, feel, and theme of Paranoia, the 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 original Paranoia, going back first, second edition. Paranoia. Yeah, no, this is, it's very much, I mean, I don't know who was involved in the, in the writing of this game, but this script is is pulled right out of, you know, the, the rule books, and, and you just, you got that feel, not only um, the feel of the game, but the feel of the time of the game. 
yes. it is very much set in that that 80s feel that you get mm. um it's it's not just it's not just the the sort of the paranoia of it um but the comedy and the references are very much in that sort of stranger things nostalgia 80s genre yeah, you which that. is a lot of what the you know the paranoia came from it's where it came where where you got it yeah no, oh, they did. Like I said, I, there's nothing I can complain about uh, the the look, the feel, and everything. Now the interface isn't terrible. Um, this is a four team member real time squad based RPG. Uh, it really reminds me of playing Baldur's Gate for the first time. For any of those old, I, I think those were Bioware back in the day, but those old those old style AD and D select your four party members, click to show where to move them and so yeah. on, real time combat that you can pause by hitting space. You hit space, you can give orders. I Iso gotta admit. Isometric CRPG. Yep, yep. Yeah, it's pretty good. I, I gotta admit, I gotta. I found myself fighting with the interface, especially in combat, uh, trying to get weapons equipped and get people to target the right thing or dive for cover or whatever. Now, maybe that's something I just will learn more through play because, well, it is a video game, right? You tend to get better the more you play them, and I'm only in the first four hours. But I did find myself fighting with that a bit. Yeah, it would have been nice to see something that came a little bit easier within those first two hours so that hours, yeah. you know, three and four, you weren't still punching things you didn't want to punch. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's That seems to be... Uh, it feels like their default cursor might be poorly chosen, perhaps. Well, the other thing too is the game was designed for console, so that's we missed that. It's it was originally it's released on PlayStation Four as well as Xbox, and the default controller is a gamepad, which I do not have. Right. So maybe on a gamepad it's easier to control, though I can't see it with an isometric RPG. Uh, the thing I don't think I'll ever learn is what Sean mentioned there is accidentally clicking on things I didn't want to click on. This was infuriating, to be honest. Um, one wrong click your character punches a bench and all of a sudden you're fined by the computer for destruction of computer property. You right click to move down a corridor and then watch as your tune crosses from a red zone and steps two feet into an orange zone by cutting a corner. Then you get fined for breaching your clearance level. Click the wrong mouse button on one of your cans of bouncy bubbly beverage and instead of splitting it to hand to your teammates, you drink one. Like this happened consistently even four hours in. I found I was constantly misclicking and oh it was so frustrating to get penalized for like i said my my character walking cutting a corner or going through this doorway because it was a shorter distance instead of going the long way around that was all the red corridors i, I was getting very annoyed with that uh and for the record it isn't out on console yet not yet okay no. maybe that's what i had heard that hadn't been released yet yeah so it december 5th it hit the epic game store uh available uh, but it won't be till 2020 when it comes to console at some point. Yeah. Now, Deanna is noting randomly being penalized or even dying kind of does feel on point for paranoia. And I get it. That should be part of it. But that should be in the story of the game, not caused by bad user interface, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I mean, the, the, the punching things I can sort of get the the path choices where you click somewhere and the game chooses your path yes. to cross over into a that seems a little questionable. Yeah. I don't know. Even the punching things. Like, oh, I right-clicked instead of left-clicked on the item. One's to look at it. The other's to attack it. And I hit the wrong button and accident. It like, just needs an undo, right? Yeah. But I guess, I don't know. That's the other thing worth noting. You can't save. There's no, oh, I'm going to save before getting into this dialogue so I can make sure I make the right choice. Hell no. You don't, that, they definitely don't have that 80s, 80s aesthetic at all. This is very permanent. Once you do something, you've done it. But you do have the ability to restart the mission, but you restart from that morning. Like, you're yeah. totally wiping everything this is, And this is something I saw a lot of reviewers mentioning. The, the feature that this game needs more than anything else is some sort of, you know... Quick save. Spawn, yeah, quick save, spawn point. You know, something to stop you from going all the way back to start yeah. again. Because one of, one of the things that happened in the game, and I, I don't think this is a spoiler in any way, I got to a point where I had clicked wrong a couple times, and my um, treason level was extremely high. And I'm like, I'm going to die. So when I got to the mission briefing, I'm like, forget it. Why not? I went nuts. And I screamed at the computer. I did everything I could do wrong just to be incinerated. 
I got incinerated, came out with my second clone, and then had to go back to the same mission briefing and play through it again and got fined for the exact same things. So I went overboard to get myself killed to clear my slate that set me back to zero treason level only to have to go back and replay the same dialogue, which my first clone had already done, to get the same demerit points and not have that clean slate. That, that, that's when I quit playing for the night because I had had enough at that point. I was a little frustrated. Yeah, so you because because the mission had gone a certain way, the yes. the the end of the mission wrap up was going to give you points Free because points. of yes. because of how the mission had gone, uh, and clearing your slate meant you by going back in you still got those same yeah, points. which was like because of just, the mission. But my clone had already reported like that. It was just dumb. My new clone should have walked out and finished the dialogue, not yeah. restarted it. Anyway, um. Some other stuff worth noting, dialogue is great on the NPC side of things, very limiting on your side as a character. Often my character would have entire conversations without any input, and then even when I was given a choice on what to say, I wasn't always happy with the options. I know that's kind of a thing in these games, but it seemed particularly bad. Like, my character just would say dumb things, and I'm like, come on, this is paranoia, why would you say that? And, like, it just, I don't know. And then that lack of options did expand to other parts of the game. Now, again, I'm only four hours in. Maybe it's going to branch. Maybe something's going to change. But, man, I'm I'm just in it for the ride. Like, I'm sitting back. Um, I'm almost watching this game, it feels like. And I'm pretty sure everyone else who has booted this game and played this game is going to go through the exact same first at least three hours that I did. They're going to get the exact same options. They're going to follow the same threads. They're going to follow the same trail and end up at the exact same place with the exact same results as I did. Now, things did branch a bit by the third mission, which was more investigative, and I did feel like I had some options, but I never felt like I had any free will. And yes, I get it. It's paranoia. I shouldn't have free will, but this was more on rails than I would have liked. Yeah. Like, it didn't even feel like I had a which way book of choose here or here. That wasn't even there. Like, I got some dialogue options, but as far as the plot, I had to go do this thing, then this thing, then this thing, then go report. Maybe it gets better. I yep. have only played four hours. Yep. Uh, and there's some interesting choices too. Graphically, um, there were some things that there, there were jokes that um, I noticed. You know, I I happened to catch them with the atten the way I was uh, paying attention to it. But it wasn't until later on when you caught the joke, and I don't want to spoil anything. So, yeah. uh, but there were little things like that where they weren't. You know, sometimes they needed to make the punchline a little bit bigger and bolder. Uh, so that it did, people didn't miss it, uh, because they they went a little subtle on some things. Again, the humor was there, but they might have you know gone a little too subtle. Um, and no, you do not actually have a limited number of clones because you can always oh, buy it? more. Oh, okay, yeah. But you, you do. Can, say, well, it, it starts as six, but yeah, there's it a, starts as six. And to be honest, you have to use some in the, the Bitcoin. Basically, there's a Bitcoin currency. There's a cryptocurrency, which makes sense for paranoia. So they have updated some of the stuff from the 80s. The fact there is a cryptocurrency and there's Facebook and there, you are always Wi-Fi. So they did take some of the stuff from the modern fourth edition of the game and throw it in there, which is cool. Um, I don't know. Are, are, like there's stuff in there. What I'd love to know, I highly doubt it, is if the R&D was random, that would be awesome. Mm, that would if be. I might not have got those options, if someone else playing through did not get the same things I did. But I have a feeling that was just as scripted as everything else. Yeah. Uh, one thing that was frustrating uh, that I noticed you you had a a huge issue wish was the hacking. Yeah. Um, the hacking I, was. I still couldn't figure out how to yeah. do it by the end. It's, I don't know what I was doing. And and, and I and I, I have seen some other comments in the other. Uh, similarly, it's not just uh you're not that kind of gamer. No, no. The hacking is the hacking system is somewhat flawed. Uh, yeah. And then I think the final big thing that I that I had and I I, I think you did as well was um, the partial voice acting yeah that was a weird so design choice they the the only voice acting in the game is the computer and yeah. interestingly if you pay to upgrade to the the deluxe version you get a different voice for the computer and i know i don't know what that difference is i guess I'm you got the better probably version. someone famous i don't know well you got the better version um yeah. and it was it was to me it was a very well done uh but automated voice a speech assistant uh but very well done whereas there's no other voice acting 
in yeah. the now because the voice acting for the computer actually suited it very well it worked it matched the tone of the the, de the dialogue it was given but that made the lack of any other voice acting stand out that much more yeah uh, i think they actually would have been better if they'd gone with sound soundtrack and no voice acting at all uh, yeah, it, it's a weird choice and that was the part that was frustrating with streaming it is basically i'm reading everything out loud and that was part of like after four hours i'm like i'm done because i'm sick of yeah. reading yeah, no, <laughs> i'm absolutely. like i don't want to read these out loud anymore i've just been reading to, to my watchers <laughs> for a while and so i'm like i don't know if i want to stream the rest of this because i just don't want to read everything out loud anymore no nope, that's fair i don't know it, it i had fun uh man it, they did a good job of making it feel like paranoia if you are a paranoia fan this is probably worth checking out if you're not a Paranoia fan, this might be a cool way to get to know the universe, but I'd wait for a Steam sale. Like, I I don't know what full price is. Like I said, this was a... 30, I was provided 35 a for copy. the deluxe, I believe. Canadian. Oh, that's not, that's not horrible. It's not bad. So. I think it was 20, maybe 29 bucks for the for the regular or yeah, 24 that's, bucks. That's not horrible. I, like, I had fun the first four hours. I was getting a little frustrated with a few things, but I had just been playing for four hours straight. And like I said, the reading out loud is more taxing than you would think like <laughs> yep. i was tired where i don't usually get tired for playing a four, four video game for three hours yeah. or three four excuse me three four hours one thing i would say if you wanted to introduce someone to the pen and paper paranoia game yeah the best way to get someone into the the thought space of what the world is like is this game i mean it yeah. really again it, they've really nailed the concept of the paranoia world beautifully whether or not it's a great game that's i think still up in the air yeah. right now i'm leaning towards no based on the little bit of what i've seen but when it comes to the actual world of paranoia they have just hit it a nail on the head another thing i would have liked to have seen is difficulty level mm -hmm. like give me an easy mode especially if it's going to be that much on rails then i'm basically watching a story right. let me go through the motions and watch the story yep like, like make the fight super easy make me not have to worry about resources uh, which did remind me one other thing. You can't back out a dialogue. So in there's an investigation part. I'll just say that much. And they give you the tools to succeed at it, which are certain books that boost your skills. So if you don't have the skills to succeed in the investigation, you don't know which of the two skills you need before talking to someone. So I st in one case, I went up and started talking to someone and went, oh, I need to have better red. So I backed out and I used red bouncy bubbly beverage and buffed my red and then talked to the person again and got what I wanted. Great. Next person I talked to ends up needed blue. There was no way to back out of that conversation. I, I was locked in. I didn't have the blue stat, even though I had a buff they had given me, obviously for this purpose, because you could have specked out your character wrong, but I couldn't do anything about it. And that came up multiple times where it's just like, whoa, whoa, no, this conversation is totally not going where I wanted to go. I want to back out. And I guess that's, again, part of it because they want permanence, but I don't know. My only option at that point is to restart the entire scenario, which we mentioned before, literally restart you waking up in your bunk for the day. So everything you've done that day is gone. Yeah, no, it's, it's tough. Um, but, uh, all right, that's done. What have we got? Uh, what have you got coming up for the coming week? All right, easy mode, Christmas party, though I don't think we're really doing anything special for Christmas, but they asked me to call it a Christmas party because, well, it's the week before Christmas. We are going to be at easy mode on the 21st, and as far as I know, we'll be at the CG realm on the 28th. Uh, Ian and Jeremy had said we're a go, but they haven't told me what we're playing. Um, as usual, I'm going to bring out the stuff I've, that's been hot lately, so I will be bringing Horrified Carpe Diem for sure because I want to get some more plays, maybe some Pulsar 2849. Uh, I also want to get some Lost Cities played. That's the, the next one on my new game to get played list. I don't know if that'll be coming out on the 21st or the 28th. So if you're in Windsor, join us easy mode this weekend, 5 till 10. The weekend after, 28th of December at the CG Realm, 5 till 10. Right. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Danielle Thomas, thank you. Sean P. Kelly, thanks, Sean. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Mr. Eckenbark, join Phil, Chris, and Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Now that they're back on, and they're off uh, They're off next, next week, but are doing a special New Year's Eve show 
and they'll actually be taking digital call-ins. All right. We will be busy gaming. Well, at least I will be busy gaming. I, unfortunately, will, will not be. So I might call in on the call. There you go. Them. You could call in. No, we are not live streaming New Year's. That was never in the plan this year. We had, I had a couple people that were at the party last year that did not appreciate being live streamed. So, I plus we didn't really get anyone watching anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> that is not in in the plans. We will be live streaming Extra Life every year, I think, because that that raises money. Right. But no years. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're gonna have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you dig the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. All right, we are going to run an ad.